our intro to tech meeting. Um, also hosting this meeting is Janelle. Janelle, will you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Janelle and Vanessa and I will be doing a intro to tech meeting, the very first one of our series. So we're looking forward to it. All right, so during this meeting, we will discuss a little bit mo more about ACM and the opportunities for underclassmen. We will discuss um, some degree plans and concentrations within tech in UTSA. We will talk about the importance of involvement, and then we will have a student panel at the end. So let's get started. Okay, so, so in ACM, um, we have various TED Talks, workshops, hackathons, socials, and volunteering events throughout the year. We also have other subtrees, other small branches within ACM. We have ACMW, which is the, the chapter, the ACM chapter for women. A lot of these opportunities are targeted towards women, but it's really open to anyone who wants to learn more, to, who wants to have a larger network of people. We have ICPC, which is a group, um, a team that works on practice tech interview problems. They work along with other students and the professor to get that practice. They also have a regional competition in October. To be part of this, you don't have to commit to being part of the competition. You can simply just go to the practice for the technical interviews. We have Rowdy Hacks, which is a hackathon that UTSA hosts. Um, we have Rowdy Creators, which is a club that um, in which you bring your own project and ideas and in the club, they help you um, work through those ideas and help and help you create pro projects. So, um, just a reminder to pay your dues. You can do this through the ACM website, uh, UTSA ACM website under the join tab. You could get involved by going to our general meetings and workshops and attending the events in our subgroups that I just mentioned. Uh, you should join our Slack and social media page to stay involved and to get notifications so that you won't miss any events coming up. So the Intro to Tech series is designed to help people um, started in tech. It's mostly targeted towards freshmen and sophomores, um, even non-tech majors, anyone who wants to learn more um, about technology. Our bi-weekly meetings consist of presentations, workshops, and panels. So next, Janelle will be talking to y'all a little bit more about the degree programs and concentrations. Uh, go ahead, Janelle. Yeah, so um, a quick outline of the, the whole presentation is going to be the different paths that you can take in tech. And so we'll go over the degree program, certificates, and the different minors that UTSA offers. But don't worry if you're not a tech major, we'll still have some good information for you, like um, different opportunities to get involved. For example, becoming an officer in ACM, attending hackathons, and also doing projects of your own. And we'll wrap up with some resources to help you get started um, pursuing whatever your interest is in the field of tech. So we're gonna start with the different paths you can take. First, I'm gonna start with the computer engineering degree program. And this is in the College of Engineering. This degree program is one where you will definitely learn how to program, but you'll also learn some about 
um, different electrical devices. So you'll take courses that are very similar to the courses you'll take if you were a computer science major, for example, computer organization, computer architecture, data structures, that's a really foundational class for any programming, as well as systems programming. And so the computer engineering degree program is really a bridge between the electrical engineering degree program and a computer science degree program because you'll get some of those electromechanics um, knowledge and skills that you would from an electrical engineering degree program, but you'll also get some of those computer programming skills that you would from a computer science degree program. And so how this differs from a computer science degree is it's more hardware focused. So for example, you'll learn about um, clock cycles, memory, and more hardware of how that memory is constrained in your computer um, and also instruction set architecture, which basically is the like anatomy of your computer, how it's built and everything like that. And in the College of Engineering, they really focus more on project management. And so you will get a lot more skills in documentation because you'll have to work with your group and figure out where to um, store like different um, information that you and your group are working on. You'll also get lots more information and practice on how to go out and explore and find information that you don't know, whether this is from looking it up online to complete a project or reaching out to a friend or a classmate or someone who's taken the class before um, to learn a new skill. And the last thing in the computer engineering degree program is you can get a certificate in AI. I know AI is kind of a buzzword now. Um, so if you're interested in artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, deep learning, maybe you go after a certificate in AI with a computer engineering degree. The second degree program that we're gonna explore is the electrical engineering degree program. And this is kind of the opposite of the computer engineering degree program in the sense that um, you'll grab some computer programming information, but you'll get more experience with electronic devices, um, whereas it was flipped for the computer engineering degree program. And again, since it's in the College of Engineering, you will be getting lots of skills in documentation and also going out and learning skills that you don't know on your own to complete those different projects because the College of Engineering is very project oriented. Um, but another interesting thing about the electrical engineering degree is it offers a lot of different concentrations to choose from. So these are all listed here and it seems like a lot of text and a long list, but this is really for you guys. If you see a word in there that you're like, oh, I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, you can go up and, and look up more about the different concentrations in the course catalog um, for UTSA. So the first concentration is systems and controls. And this deals a lot with robotics. Um, and so you hear robotics and you think it would be very hands-on like building stuff, but surprisingly, it's a lot more math and a lot more calculations of how these different systems are gonna work. Um, then, hands-on experience, which might be different than what you're expecting. The second concentration is communication. And this studies how signals get passed from devices. Unlike the systems and controls concentrations, this one is a lot more hands-on. Um, some of the things that you'll gain some knowledge in is um, signals, fiber optics, and electromagnetics. So if you're really interested in how devices communicate with each other, that might be for you. The third concentration is computer engineering. So maybe you don't want a computer engineering degree because you're interested more in the um, electronic devices part of it, but you could still get a concentration where you can learn some programming languages, both the low level languages such as assembly um, and the high level languages like uh, C or C++ to where um, they have lots of functions in them. And the next concentration that we're going to talk about is electronic materials and devices. And so this concentration is really about the industrial manufacturing processes of um, 
computer parts. And so you'll get a surprising amount of chemical engineering background from this. And it's a really low level um, area of study where you'll get to see how um, things like transitions, transistors are made. And so the last concentration that we're going to talk about is di digital signal processing. And this is probably the most broad concentration to where you can get the most um, broad background in the concentrations of the electrical engineering degree. And this is all about manipulating signals. So we can get an input signal, we can get input data, um, but interpreting it and manipulating it for whatever you want your computer program to do is really what digital signal processing is all about. And just like the um, computer engineering degree, you will also have the opportunity to get a certificate in AI from the electrical engineering degree as well. The final degree program we're gonna talk about is the one that I'm most familiar with. Um, so you can, you can ask our uh, College of Engineering student, Jonathan, if you have any questions about the previous two, but um, computer science, it involves a lot of programming. Um, you're gonna learn how to write different programs for different tasks that you want to complete. And so that being said, CS can sound kind of like a broad degree, but I really encourage you to find your um, specific interest and what you want to study throughout your electives. And so that way you can kind of specify your degree to be something that you enjoy learning. And one way you can do this is concentration. So there's four concentrations. Um, there's a concentration in software engineering, which is probably one of the most popular. If you really like to tackle some big problem and plan it all out in code and write some scripts or some um, or multiple scripts that will complete this task and will be able to um, kind of be this, this uh, interface between like the user and the computer then software might be for you. Um, the next concentration is cloud and systems. And so this is all about how data is stored specifically through the cloud. So accessing your data through the internet rather than having some server in the next room. And so if you're interested on how this data gets um, transferred and also maybe some of the security between the transfer and also how it's stored, then cloud and systems um, might be the concentration for you. And the third concentration is cybersecurity. So with cybersecurity, you have the opportunity to learn some skills both on the offensive side and the defensive side of security, as well as some different um, interesting little topics like uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, if you're interested in Bitcoin, I know we have a class on that. And there's also different classes on forensics. Um, so after an attack, what happens? And the final concentration in CS is data science. And so this concentration is really useful if you want to know how to work with and how to manipulate data, because there's so many, so much data um, out in the world and we need to manipulate it before we can put it into a lot of these computer programs. So if you really want to understand um, what you need from your data and how to manipulate it and get, a, get um, what you need from it, then data science um, could be something that you wanna look into. Data science also gives you a bit of an introduction into machine learning and AI because AI uses um, lots of data and it's important to have the like clean, um, correct data to enter into those models. And so like I mentioned with the College of Engineering, there are some team projects in the computer science degree program um, but I wouldn't say that it's as extensive as the engineering courses, but you can take classes like senior design where you are, you are in a team and you're building your own project. Another unique thing that the College of Sciences offers is the cyber operations track. So if you're really into cybersecurity, um, maybe more so than the concentration, you can just take basically all of the cybersecurity um, electives and you can get a kind of like certificate for completing the cyber operations track. 
And maybe you're not a computer science major, maybe you're not an electrical or computer engineer major, but you are interested in tech. A good thing to do might be to get a computer science minor, and that will just set you up with the basic skills you need to code. And the last thing um, that the computer science department offers is a certificate in pathogenic outbreak investigation. And this is really interesting, especially in the time of um, COVID because there is a huge overlap between what we can study in biology and how we can advance medicine um, and computer programs, specifically AI. So that, that seems like it might be an interesting course to take or um, certificate to complete, especially in a time of COVID. And so next I'm gonna pass it back off to Vanessa and she's gonna talk about um, how to get involved outside the classroom. So maybe you're not in a degree program, but how you can still get involved in tech. Thank you, Janelle. Yeah, the tech field is very large. So it's always interesting to learn a little bit about the degrees and concentrations offered here at UTSA. Okay. So um, it's, I think it's important to highlight the importance of involvement. Um, being involved in, in ACM, I think, gives you an experience that you can't really get only from classes. Um, involvement shows to employers that you have a passion for tech and that's what they really look for. Um, there's multiple ways to increase involvement. One of them is to become an ACM officer, to join Rowdy Creators and work on a project that interests you, to attend Rowdy Hacks, um, which really provide real world um, problems. A a ICPC is also a really good resource to use. So um, the first steps to becoming good, an officer um, is to become a junior officer. Um, in the junior officer position, you sort of shadow the officer position. You learn what tasks and duties they have to do. Um, this also um, helps you transition into the officer role more smoothly, and it also helps your resume. So um, hackathons are project-based. Um, you work on a project with the team. There is also mentors at the hackathons which help, um, that help, that help you uh, find a solution. It is a common misconception to think that you have to have a lot of technical background to attend a hackathon. That is not true. You can go as an underclassman and still um, do very well. Um, like I said, UTSA has a supportive community that helps underclassmen a lot. And uh, like I said, you get real world experience um, working in, in a project and employers really like to see that in someone's resume. They'll typically ask you um, what you did at the hackathon, um, what, what algorithms you used and, and so on. And you get to meet new people there too. Do you wanna do this one, Janelle? Yeah, um, so we're gonna go back a little bit. Um, kind of building on hackathons, hackathons is where you get the opportunity to create a project in a very short timeline. Um, but another idea to get involved in tech, no matter what major you are, even if you're a tech major, it's very, very nice to see somebody who has personal projects of their own. And so what I mean by a personal project is if you're interested in a specific area of tech, or if you, have something that you're wondering about, you can build something on your own, whether it's just writing a script or maybe you include some hardware in it as well um, in order to learn new skills and then also kind of make something that you like. Um, so personal projects are a great resume booster. Anytime you are interviewing or talking to any tech companies, they're gonna wanna know what um, you're working on outside of class. And if you show that you are still working on tech projects because that's what you're interested in and you're constantly learning outside of the classroom, that's something that's really gonna stand out 
um, to somebody who's recruiting for internships or for job positions. Furthermore, it's a great opportunity for you to learn some new skills for yourself. Um, so if you have something that you want to learn, I encourage you to center a project around it. And you can work on anything that you're interested in. It doesn't have to be groundbreaking. Um, for example, a great starting project could be to make a, a calculator or maybe a to-do list app um, for yourself. So you can kind of customize it to what you want to do in your skill level. Um, and you could also do stuff way more advanced, um, like a prosthetic arm or um, some like deep learning model. And although they're personal projects, there are still resources out there to help you. You're very much not alone. Um, there are tons of tutorials on YouTube for different projects that other people have done. Um, and you could just follow one of those and learn how they did it. Also, your classmates and your friends are a really great resource. If you all are interested in something similar or you all want to take your diverse strengths and put them together on a project, that could be a really fun way to explore tech, but also just hang out with your friends. And something that I'll refer you to for personal projects is ACM's Rowdy Creators. That's really what they're all about, is they love to see people come in with ideas or, and they'll put you with a team or if you have your own idea and you want to work individually, then you can build that project and they'll provide the space for you to do that along with some people who maybe you know a little bit more in the field and can help you out. So I would definitely encourage you to go to Rowdy Creators if you're interested in projects. And so last, we're just gonna go through some resources to help you get started um, in exploring tech um, before we go into our panel. So something that I, someone that I um, asked about this resources was um, Leon, who he did all of these talks on Mondays last year, and he knows a lot about tech. And so I was wondering what different resources does he use? And he brought up a good point, which is you need to know what resources will help you do what you wanna do, but you also wanna know what's relevant in the field and you want to keep up to date. And so that's where this knowing what to look for comes in. So knowing what to learn next um, can be a big problem. And so for example, I'll use my Twitter page to follow um, different people in tech that they're studying the same field that I'm interested in, which for example is machine learning. And so I get all of these headlines and I can go and choose um, which I want to explore further. And it gives me a lot of great ideas for what to work on next. Reddit is also a really great place for this. Um, there's tons of subreddits, everything from um, tech help, like some IT problem to building your own PC. And it's a great community to kind of see what, what direction um, the tech field is going in. And the last thing is something that's actually new to me. Um, I'll probably try it out though. Uh, it's a, a extension for your browser and it's called daily.dev. And it'll kind of pop up with different um, like tech news. And so that's another way that you can stay informed. So if you know what you wanna do, um, some resources for actually completing that project would be YouTube. Like I said, for personal projects, there are tons of video tutorials out there for um, almost anything, or you can patch together a few video tutorials to do something of your own. Another great resource is blog posts. I know the Python community in general has a lot of great blog posts um, about different projects using Python. And then the last two, Udemy and Code Academy, are two online services that are more course formatted, where Udemy, they have, every, they have courses in everything from graphic design um, to something more technical and like machine learning and deep learning and stuff like that. Um, and then Code Academy, they actually, it's a great place if you just want to get started. Um, you can take a quiz to see your skill level and you can go based off of like programming language and they'll show you some neat things you can do with each language. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Vanessa to introduce our student panel for tonight. And we'll try to get to some of the questions that um, I see you all posted in the, in the Slido, maybe if some of our panelists want to speak to them or if Vanessa and I can speak to them. 
Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and let her introduce our panelists for this evening. All right, so we will transition now to our student panel. Um, we have three students from UTSA here with us. I will let them introduce themselves um, and then we can ask them questions. Okay, so Chris, would you like to start first? Hello, uh, my name is Chris DeLeon. I am the ACM president. I am a senior in computer science. And, um, and yeah, just uh, really loving programming. Uh, I would say if you're a really organized person, just to start off with, if you're really like organized person and love like getting, you know, all your checklists and your calendar in order for, for CS, doing a software engineering concentration is really the way to go. Thank you. Jonathan, would you like to go next? Sure, no problem. Uh, everyone, my name is Jonathan. Uh, I am a senior as well as the ACM treasurer and Rowdy Hacks financial director. I'm a dual major in electrical and computer engineering. And funnily enough, I actually didn't start out <laughs> as electrical or computer. I started out as mechanical, but changed <laughs> my degree at the very last second before orientation when I started getting into things like Python, uh, putting Linux on computers myself starting around in high school. Um, yeah, so I can't wait to hear any questions that y'all have today. Awesome, thank you. Tiba, you're next. Hello everyone, my name is Tiba. I am a CS major here at UTSA. This is my second year. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to answer your questions. Hopefully I can provide you guys with um, the most knowledge I can, so yeah. Awesome. Okay, so do we have any questions in the chat, Janelle? Yeah, um, so somebody in the Slido asked, um, can I change my concentration if I no longer like it? And um, this might be something, I'm curious if any of you guys have any experience with that or if this is something that um, we can just answer for some people. So does anyone have any experience with changing their concentration? I'm, I'm actually not sure on that one. Uh, personally, I held off on declaring my uh, concentration until like the last semester. So um, yeah, not too sure. I, I did hear, uh, there's probably something to ask your advisor unless Jonathan knows. Yeah, yeah. So that's something I was actually interested in because I started off as an elect just an electrical engineer and I was curious about changing my concentration from systems and controls because I just, I wasn't as into the math as I guess I should be for that concentration and was more interested in programming. And I asked my advisor and she told me, you, you can. So basically what would happen, at least in the engineering department would be, um, from what I remember is you, you'll have already taken the classes for that concentration. But if the concentration for the one that you're now interested in is what you really want to go on your degree, that's the one that you can choose. So if you have the classes for either concentration, you can choose which one you want to be on your degree. But there's, in terms of like revoking the classes that you've already done, there's nothing really in terms of that. But if it's something you want upfront on your degree, it's something you can totally choose from either or, provided you finish all the classes for them. Right, I think um, Jonathan brings up a good point. It's where you can, take classes and you're not necessarily committing to that concentration. For example, um, taking like an intro to cyber course, um, you're taking that course and it can go towards your concentration. But if you don't like that course, you're not pressured to stay in that concentration unless you're facing some credit hour limit. So um, you have a little bit of wiggle room depending on how many credits you have to kind of explore and change paths. Um, the next question that we have, I don't know if anybody here has pursued this certificate, but it's where do I go to start on the pathogenic outbreak investigation certificate? Um, where I would start, um, unless um, anybody has any experience with it, please um, jump in. But where I would start is the course catalog. So that's where we found all of this information on the different degree programs. And so if you're interested in it, um, definitely talk to your advisor about it and you can see some of the courses you'll be taking on the catalog. Um, 
the next question though, I think might be a good question for Chris. Um, it says, does web developer fall under the software engineering concentration? So uh, not, not explicitly, no. Um, for the software engineering, it's like there's a couple of software engineering classes that really focus on documentation and things like requirements gathering, like knowing ahead of time what what your software needs to do and then designing how it's going to accomplish those tasks. Um, as far as web development, we actually, there was a specific concentration for that, this, uh, right, Janelle? Janelle? Um, I did not see a specific concentration, but I, I know it was under there. Cloud. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, perhaps. Again, that would be um, mm -hmm. course catalog information yeah. that I would I would look for. Yeah, if um, if nothing else, I mean, I know we do. I am currently in a web tech class. We do offer that, um, even if it's not necessarily a concentration. Web tech is something you can do. Um, that's uh, that's pretty great. Yeah. So the next question, we just have a couple more, and then we'll go to more broad questions for all of our panelists is, um, I don't know if anybody here has the experience of doing an independent study or research with a professor, um, but somebody's wondering what are the benefits of doing that. So if anybody has experience in that, feel free to speak up or else um, I can kind of speak to what that would look like. So the independent study or research um, the benefit of it would be that you get to take a course and get credit for it and you get to pursue something that you like and it's definitely like a mentor mentee kind of relationship with that professor um, so as long as you guys are kind of aligned on the same page with what you're interested in and um, what you're pursuing it can be really great to get that like one-on-one -on -one experience um, with that professor Uh, that question actually reminded me of something that uh, one of my friends is actually doing. Uh, so in the engineering department, uh, if you are doing an internship, you can do, I don't know if it's the same in the computer science department, but you can take what's called uh, an engineering co-op. And so you apply through to the, the department to see, if your co to see if your internship applies. And if it does, they actually can count that internship towards one of your technical electives. And it's just something that I thought was really neat. You know, it saves it saves money on the classes that you have to take, saves time, and you're also getting paid for it, technically. I would like to mention that I know that's actually also offered in the CS department. So if you're interested in that, in um, getting your internship to count as credit, you can also do the same thing. So yeah, I just wanted to add that. And to, to go back one question I do see in the chat, Jada, one of our um, one of our previous officers for ACM mentions that uh, web tech can count towards a software engineering concentration. Um, you just have to ask your advisor and I guess they do like a, a waiver to uh, to make that work for you. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you so much, Jada. Um, and thank you, Tiva and Jonathan for your different perspectives. Um, on opportunities to get credit through like internships from both colleges. So the last um, question that we have is kind of that's more specific is who retains the right to projects if you create one with Ready Creators. So that's something that I might refer you more to them for, but I know Jonathan actually um, completed a project with Rowdy Creators. Would you want to talk about that experience a little bit? Um, I know it was like a sentiment analysis pro um, project. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I can talk a little bit about that. So over the summer, me and uh, me, Talha Khan, and I think it was Jason McCullough worked on a sentiment analysis project just as something, you know, to keep it, the vibes going through the summer. And we were interested in whether or not, or rather, <sighs> how the rights are retained uh, from students to project. I actually have the information here, uh, if I can get some time to pull it up. Uh, an email directly from, uh, I wanna say Christine Burke. Yeah, with the exact like specifications on 
who retains those rights. So let me just pull this up here. And she gave me a really, a really good breakdown of it. Um, it's here, right here, student ownership of IP. All IP created by students is considered sole property of the students unless one of the following conditions is met. The student is also an employee and the IP is developed within the scope of his or her employment. Uh, the student works on an institutional project or under a work for hire contract. Uh, student works, student chooses to participate in research which results in the creation of IP and has been committed to government, philanthropic or corporate sponsor. Or the student is working on a project in which a faculty member, advisor or other UTSA employee is also an inventor, in which case federal rules of joint inventorship apply. And so, yeah, that's what we pulled from uh, some of our contacts there. There's also a, I think a link I can provide in the chat if anybody is interested to read that because I think UTSA provides that on its website. I'll go ahead and do that right now. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jonathan. I think um, the best thing would be is to just explore it with Rowdy Creators. Um, I know that they're definitely well-versed in that um, realm which is why Jonathan knew so much about it is because he was really involved in Rowdy Creators. So I would, I would refer you um, to them and everything for that. Um, maybe before we get to um, kind of some more questions in the Slido, um, we can ask some more general questions for all of our members, Vanessa? Yes. So this is for anyone, anyone can answer it. Um, what, what were some studying tips that helped you the most in your tech classes? Um, so I think this really differs for everyone, um, but for me, what worked for me is active learning and um, really listening into the course and what the professor is doing and interacting with that. And also after um, the lecture, I also use that later, go on and use that knowledge and build examples um, or use it to um, in my projects and stuff like that. So definitely um, implementing what you learn will definitely help it help it stick and you'll be able to refer back to it much easier. Um, so yeah, that's what worked for me. Thank you. I guess I'll go ahead and hop in on this. Um, one, one thing for me is just really uh, engaging in classrooms, um, which is going to be, you know, a little bit more difficult and, and weird to do, you know, here now that we're virtual, but, you know, making sure that you're, you're really paying attention to class, um, attend live lectures if you can, and, and ask questions and make sure you're really understanding the concept. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, you can't make it to classes or, or you're not grasping the concepts while you're while you're there in the lecture, go to office hours and speak to your teachers directly. They, um, you know, going one on one and like when they can get a grasp of how you understand things, it can really make a difference on, you know, them being able to, to phrase things specifically um, in a way for you to be able to best understand it. So really, uh, really take advantage of, of, you know, the teachers that you've got there. Don't, don't just like watch it, watch your, your lectures like it was some random YouTube series, like engage with your teachers, take advantage of that. Yeah, thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Studying for yeah. tech classes yeah. can be different from regular classes. So I'm sure this is very valuable information. This is another question. Is there something you wish you knew as an underclassman um, before entering your tech classes? And if so, what was that? Uh, I guess I can kind of go first on that one. Um, something that really stuck with me throughout uh, my underclassman experience was Math is super important and you'll probably use it for every class that you take in tech, whether that be engineering, computer science. Uh, uh, but I would say the thing that I pulled the, the most uh, that I learned was that don't let it discourage you if you're not that great at it at first. Um, I personally didn't really pick up speed with, you know, pre-cal calculus until Cal 2 and then I started to like things started to really click and um, 
kind of snowballed from there to where I was like, okay, yeah, I have a good grasp on things. But I saw so many of my friends discouraged and they just kind of left the, the degree plan because they thought they weren't cut out for it. Um, most, some of the times that's just not true, you know, whether it be like life circumstances or maybe you just don't click with a certain professor. Um, definitely keep working at it and don't be discouraged by it. Great information, Jonathan. Thank you. I definitely agree with Jonathan. And this was kind of already mentioned, but I just would like to add on that. Definitely use your resources, whether that be professors or like the internet. For me personally, I, before I, the summer before college, I really utilized the internet to learn more about the computer science degree in college and what that entails, learn more about how to kind of apply early on to internships as an underclassman and build your resume and I uh, learned what hackathons are um, and also participating in organizations as well like ACM and a lot of great organizations as well like advanced robotics and other stuff that UTS, uh, UTSA offers. So definitely use the resources that you have. Um, you are paying for them so you might as well use them um, and they'll definitely help you understand um, more about the degree and CS as an underclassman which I think is really useful to know um, early on. So yeah. Thank you, Tia. Yeah, and I'd just like to, to focus a little bit on, on one of the things she said was that, you know, uh, getting into internships early, that, um, you know, internships are, they don't expect you to know everything. They, they really know it's, it's going to be a learning opportunity for you. So, you know, don't be afraid to, to look for internships as, as, a, um, as a freshman or a sophomore. There are, there are companies who actually, you know, seek out people just beginning their their college years um like google google has a program that specifically one even um like the summer year immediately after people graduate high school they, they start taking interns so um you know be on the lookout for those opportunities for for me i waited too long um you know i waited till to like my junior year to start looking for um like the end of my junior year to start looking for internships and um you know by that point there, there's you can still get an internship at that, but I, I, I missed a lot of opportunities earlier on and, um, and getting those internships really, really help you get a job um, once you do graduate. So um, be on the lookout for internships. Thank you. Yeah, it's important to know um, that there is um, opportunities specifically for underclassmen. Um, do we have any more questions in the Slido or the chat, Janelle? Yeah, yeah, we have a couple. Um, this one actually goes perfectly kind of what with Chris said. Um, it's asking what professional experiences should I look for as an underclassman? Um, so I know Chris um, answered that you should be like looking for internship opportunities too. I'm curious, like Tiba and Jonathan, what do you do to, and even Chris, what did you do to kind of advance your um, knowledge in tech? as an underclassman. Uh, yeah, so for me, uh, I was in the pretty much the same boat as Chris. Um, I waited, I waited way too long to start looking. And so perfect thing for me was getting involved. Like I knew so many people who were in organizations, but I had never tried it out for myself until until last semester. And I can definitely see the benefit of you know creating your network um finding friends who you know are into the same things as you um you know those kind of experiences build upon themselves till you <laughs> till i guess you don't even realize that you're working professionally already and even then you know those connections you make never really go away <laughs> so getting involved definitely is uh, probably the start and the best way to start your uh uh, professional experiences. Yeah, I definitely agree with Jonathan. Building your network is really important. And also, I guess if you're, this was more internship specific question, right? So I guess like knowing um, what you're passionate about, like whether it's software engineering, data science, and trying to find internships that are tailored more towards that and applying for them. Um, I think it's really important to know what you're trying to go towards. 
Um, and you can explore more uh, on that with projects like we've kind of mentioned previously, um, you know, building projects that are tailored more towards that. And that actually helps you get those internships because um, they'll know that you have experience that is tailored towards um, what you're trying to internship at. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, um, both of you, for that response. I think there are a lot of professional experiences you can look for as an underclassman. Um, how um, Chris and Tebow talked about how you can look for internships. There are internships out there. Um, if you are just interested and you're wanting to learn and you can show them that you're a good fit. And then Jonathan mentioned a great way to start would just be with getting involved in clubs and professional organizations. Um, so we have another question for everybody on the panel. This might be a little bit of a hard one. Um, what are your favorite classes? Mine was, um, I, I tried to put like my hair in a ponytail because the comments about, but it's not working too well. Anyways, um, one, one of my favorite classes was actually um, secure software and development, uh, a, or secure software development. Um, I took that with uh, Dr. Rocky Slavin and he, um, he did a really good job of like going over various topics. It was a little bit of software engineering. It was a little bit of um, learning best practices for, um, you know, how to, how to keep, uh, how to develop secure systems and how to uh, plan out software development so that when you finally get to implementing it, it's, it's really secure. And, um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a high level overview of things, but I actually really enjoyed it and it, it uh, taught me a lot of stuff. I think I might be a little early on to like answer this question specifically because of only taking three uh, kind of computer science in the past couple semesters, now I'm taking four, but I really enjoyed data structures, um, just really learning about the different algorithms and data structures that do exist and how we can utilize them into different um, projects and implementing specific tasks. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's, um, as you dive in and get further, there's definitely gonna be more, um, you know, classes that are interesting, um, more interesting to you because you get to dive deeper into topics. Um, so you get to choose what you're more interested in, especially as you dive into concentrations. So yeah. Hey, Jonathan, you're muted. My bad, misclick. <laughs> For me, it would be uh, microcomputer systems too, uh, specifically because it just kind of had a mix of like everything that I love about my about my double major. It had a uh, we worked with uh, electric motors. Um, we did a lot of programming in C, uh, working with uh, development environments and uh, like uh, like project boards. Um, so we worked with the project board called KL twenty five Z which is a, um, it's a development platform for uh, microcontrollers and uh, microcontrol systems. And so yeah, we learned a lot in that class and even did a little bit of assembly too. <laughs> so um, we can go with another question from the Slido and then um, maybe we'll go to Vanessa again for um, some more questions for our panelists. So our, question from the Sligo is, as students, what is the best way for you to get a letter of recommendation from a professor? I think this is something people have a lot of anxiety about. Um, so maybe if you guys can speak to if you've ever gotten a letter of recommendation and kind of like how you went about that. So I haven't necessarily gotten a letter of recommendation. But I guess the first step is really just to communicate with your professor as much as possible. Um, really ask some class questions and even beyond the class and what like you can talk about um, their experience, ask them about their experiences in the field, um, maybe specific topics that they're doing research in, um, and maybe even try to do research with them. And that could be a way for you to, um, you know, get a letter of recommendation that way. So definitely communicate with your professor. Um, I think that's the best way to start. 
Yeah, um, definitely, you know, communicating that that can be in various forms like, um, yeah, organizations, as Leon's saying in chat, um, going to office hours. For, for me, I've got a really good, um, like I've got a, a good connection with Dr. Robinson. He's our um, faculty advisor for ACM. So being on the ACM organization really um, gives us a lot of face time with him. Um, going to events like ICPC, you get some, you know, like smaller group interactions with Doc Rob and Dr. Charette. And, um, and then of course, you know, office hours, getting that one-on-one -on -one time, um, really developing that relationship can you know, make it a lot less awkward when it comes time to ask them for something like, like a recommendation. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't asked him for a recommendation yet, but he, um, he'd probably be the first person I'd go to just because we have a good relationship. All right, yeah, thank you. Um, I think that you all gave some really good advice about how to go about that because it can be kind of an awkward encounter, but um, I'll go ahead and pass it back to Vanessa for some more questions for our panelists. Okay. Thank you guys for sharing that. Um, so I have another, another question for y'all. So have any of you attended a tech conference? And if so, what was the most valuable part of it? Um, actually, just recently, um, everyone on the Rowdy Hacks team, which is uh, the HSA Hackathon, got to go on a conference, an MLH conference for organizers, um, which uh, those who are organizing hackathons. And it was a really great experience. It's really cool to see um, that it was a worldwide event. So you really get to see um, the big community that you're a part of um, and you get to network with people just like you and companies as well. Uh, I think GitHub, DevPost and Microsoft was there. So you can also like, we got to ask some questions as well. Uh, about the opportunities and career career opportunities that they do have. So yeah, I think it's a really great, great place to network and also um, with people like you and companies as well. Um, so I definitely recommend that you guys go to as mon many conferences as you possibly can because it's a really great place to network. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, yeah, what Tifa said is totally right. Um, people underestimate the value of finding people who are who are like you, um, who are into tech, and networking is such a powerful tool, especially in this day and age where everything is mostly online. Um, just being around, like, being able to have the opportunity to even just make friends, you know, is is great. You know, it's my personal philosophy that nobody really gets where they are on their own, and so. Um, having places like that, conferences, to find people to hang out with and, you know, even further your career is, is the best. Um, for me, well, I'd like to just like, one of the things of going to conferences, you get like a little swag, you know, like squeaky ducks and stuff and stickers and whatnot. Um, but so... Also, like I've done, um, I've done these like tech talks that are not um, not necessarily like conference, but it's like you know just just one event that you might see at a conference. I um, did one with Intuit a couple weeks back, and they were talking about some of the technologies they use and um, uh, you know how how they're employing different things like artificial intelligence to help with their um, their whole tax system, making it so that they're their AI can do a lot of the work without them having to go and code manually lots and lots of different things from um, from new bills as they come out. There's a 800 page payment protection program came out and they were able to largely um, help people navigate that with an AI without having to read it and code you know, 800 pages worth of things into their tax software. So I thought that was really neat. And so, um, you know, aside from the networking abilities, you also get um, you know, inside knowledge on to on how companies are using technology. You can learn about the company and um, see if you know you might be interested in doing some of the stuff that they're they're working on. 
Thank you, guys. I agree. Um, attending conferences, I think, is really important because you get to speak to recruiters, practice your networking skills, and learn about new products. And I think it's it's important to attend a, a tech conference. Um, I'll go ahead. It, do we have any more questions on the Slido? If not, I'll go ahead and ask another broader question. Um, so we are kind of coming to the end here. I see I see in the chat for the conference um, question that Ana Arroyo actually said Vanessa at Grace Hopper. Um, so if, if you wanted to expand a little bit more on that and then we can tell them about um, the upcoming events we have. Sure. Um, yeah, so I attended the Grace Hopper conference and I went on a scholarship. So they, um, they paid my registration fee. Um, I, it was a three day conference and it was very packed with a lot of events. I was able to hear a lot of um, the leading women in tech um, speak. Uh, they had a lot of events and then they also had a large career fair and you were able to speak to employers of so many different tech companies. It was a really great experience. And um, at large um, um, career fairs like this, usually, um, they have um, like an atten a student attendee list that companies have access to. And sometimes they even uh, reach out to you and say uh, like, oh, I know you're attending this conference. Uh, we would like to interview you. Uh, tell us what time uh, works for you. So uh, attending these conferences really opens um, many opportunities for you. So it's something that I would um, really um, want everybody to do an ACM. There's, like I said, there's a lot of um, scholarships um, to attend conferences out of state. Um, we will be giving more information on that later on in ACM, but yes, definitely try to attend tech conferences. All right, um, I think we have a couple more questions in the Slido that unfortunately I don't think we have time for, but I want to encourage you, please reach out to ACM, throw these questions in the Slack, email us. Um, we definitely want to help everybody in this organization as much as possible be successful in tech. Um, so yeah, go ahead and contact us with those questions. And we are actually gonna tell you about some upcoming events that we have for ACM. So um, upcoming, we have a game night on Discord, September 4th. Uh, September 8th, we have a club meeting for ACMW, our women's chapter. And they will discuss um, some inter internship and career preparation tips. And September 9th, we will have an internship, um, a student internship panel. They will discuss their experiences um, in this meeting. So please uh, follow our, our social media pages to stay updated on our future events. Yes, um, and also there's a QR code there for a calendar of all of the events we'll be having. Um, that's our, on our website. And Vanessa and I just want to say thank you all for tuning in. Um, we really hope that you took something from this and were able to kind of relate to some of the panelists up here and get some of your questions answered about um, different paths, different um, involvement opportunities and different resources available for students in tech. Um, so thank you guys for tuning in and hopefully we'll see you at game night on September 4th. Thank you to our panelists too. Tiba, Chris and Jonathan, thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. And if you have any more questions, like Janelle said, please reach out. We'll be happy to help you.